All right, today, hey guys, it's Fyodor Dostoevsky talk. I hope that you have heard of him. He's a Russian novelist, and I'm going to go through a little bi biography, get into who he was, and then I'm going to read a little excerpt, just the very beginning of my favorite of his books, uh, The Brothers Karamazov. Some people might call it The Brothers Karamazov. Forgive me already for having the worst most useless Russian accent ever and I'm going to try to just go through a little bit of who he was and maybe kind of talk about the pain this guy went through um, and how he dealt with it and how it manifested in his writing uh, kind of in unexpected ways I would think and I just think it's cool to break down uh, where a guy's coming from especially when I think he's you know, almost universally acclaimed as a as a, a genius or something nearing genius level of literary prowess. I certainly think he is. Uh, I don't think I don't. I wonder if he would be so huge this day and age. Um, he's kind of a snarky, and that's kind of what I want to get at. He's a he's got a little bit of bite and grit to his work. Um, okay, let's go through uh, the 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 young man okay he's born in moscow okay 1821 so way back in the day he doctor son so that sounds pretty good starting out good religious family and there's a lot of religion in uh, his all of his books if you've ever read the double or notes from the underground he's a he's a i, I guess he'd be eastern orthodox you know that's the normal thing for uh, russians back then pre the Soviet Union time, uh, educated by tutors, mother and father, um, but at 13, sent private school, so that sucks, got sent away, and uh, while he's away, I guess, I assume, two years, his mother died, so total bummer, so he's 15, his mother dies, his father sucked, apparently, and uh, was killed, was murdered in 1839, so uh, not the greatest childhood looking like. 19, 1839, so he was, what, 18? So, you know, losing your parent early sucks, but uh, mom's already dead, and now father was murdered. Not uh, That's probably going to have an effect on the old psyche, and I can't say how that didn't leave an indelible impression on his brain. Um, okay, so he went to St. Petersburg uh, School, he was going to be something else, but he hated math, I guess, because he didn't want to be an engineer. He, he decided to be a writer. I can kind of, uh, uh, I, can, I, can, I can get down with that. Uh, I, I went to school myself to be a doctor, and like the last class I took, uh, I decided, you know, like four years in college, and I was like, you know, now that I think about it, I just want to sing songs and write that was kind of a waste <laughs> anyway he finished school and um, turned uh, his career uh, devoted himself to writing uh, he, uh, yeah, his early letters show him to be a young man of passion and energy by the way I'm getting this from uh, the world of encyclopedia of world biography I don't know how great that is as a source but it seems somewhat legit I'll put the link down below just so you can go and read it if you want to um, and that's what I'm reading from here. Okay, early writings. So he began writing about poor people. I don't really know how poor he was, um, but, you know, that he obviously had some kind of, you know, he was interested in the plight of the peasantry, and, I, you know, I don't know if serfdom had been abolished by the, the I don't know when the serfdom was abolished, but I think it was after, way after this, probably late 1800s. Um, and even then, it didn't get great for the lower class in Russia. Okay, so 1843, Poor Folk, uh, he wrote, and Social Tale about Down and Out Dude, uh, some government apparatchik. And, you know, I think, you know, he got some early success. So early success, that's that can be a double-edged sword, man. So was, he, he, had, he hit the sophomore slump with a double, which actually is like my second favorite book. I mean, Crime and Punishment is sick, but I like the doubles. But apparently, nobody liked that, and so 
he probably got depressed after that because, you know, if you're on the mountaintop and then all of a sudden somebody slaps you down, you start tumbling. Um, so that made him troubled. So for the next, you know, three or four years, it looks like he was aimless and confused, as are most writers, but he was probably especially <laughs> aimless and confused uh, owing to his messed up past and the fact that you know maybe he thought he was you know peeking his way through the clouds and all of a sudden now he's back to square one so he's experimenting i think this probably made him a better writer you know in the end you know he probably was working with a lot of different forms and a lot of stuff that maybe he's never seen the light of day it's probably in some archive somewhere in friggin russia okay so his uh, life showed he was doing some experimenting in his personal life, and he was uh, anti-government. So, uh, something called the Petrushevsky Circle, I guess. Petrushevsky Circle? And again, I apologize for that ridiculous enunciation. So, he was arrested, thrown in prison, sentenced to death. I love this. Uh, my favorite part of the vaunted encyclopedia of world biography and reality though this sentence was only a joke ha at one point however Dostoevsky believed he had moments to live and he never forgot the feelings of that experience he was sentenced to four years in prison and four years of forced service in the army in Siberia Russia okay so this thing says he was a joke uh, I'm pretty sure that when I've read different accounts of this I think he was l seriously Put up against a freaking wall or a post or something and a bunch of dudes pointed guns at him so j funny joke yeah that's not gonna mess you up for freaking life okay so instead of that he was in prison i don't even know how subversive his anti-government action was but you know and it's we're talking about russia the place has been kind of let's say tumultuous uh, just to be nice for, since freaking forever all right so he got out of siberia eventually so i'm thinking the guy's pretty tough forced four years of forced service in the army in siberia okay he left siberia he got out things are good right 1859 okay back in st petersburg st petersburg is kind of a i guess would be like a pretty sweet place that's where they had all the palaces and stuff right back in the day i don't know but Lo and behold, he's got an unhealthy wife whom he married in Siberia. You know, it seems like nothing good happens in Siberia. I'm just going to make a blanket statement there. Uh, maybe it's like a it's like a golden land now, but jeez. Their marriage wasn't happy. <laughs> to support himself, uh, Dostoevsky edited a journal, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he published memoirs from the House of the Dead, a work of fiction about his... I'm sure wonderful experiences in friggin' prison in Russia. Uh, he, he showed no great, this says this, whatever, whoever this guy is, says, showed no great artistic advance over his early work and gave no hint of the greatness that came forth in 16, 1864 with his Notes from the Underground, which is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, so he had poor health, poverty, complicated emotional situations. The hits just keep on coming for old Fyodor. Fyodor? I'm just going to say it like Theodore, but with an F. Fyodor. All right. He fell in love um, with a young student, Polina Suslova. And, oh, yeah, look at this. He had a frustrating affair with her. I can't believe that his unfair or his affair wasn't just marked with wonderful happy moments of good cheer all right so he got out of the country you know he probably should have done that earlier <laughs> but he got out in 62 and 63 to get uh, get away from people <laughs> he's apparently he had a gambling problem i think and you know i'm gonna go ahead and throw in a bunch of vodka into the equation even though i have no um, historical evidence of that i mean i didn't look at his liver and i didn't do the post-mortem so, Notes from the Underground is a short novel. That's the one that uh, apparently this guy says was great. And I'm saying it's great, too. Um, it talks about individual freedom being necessary. Probably something you're going to want to say after you get out of Siberia. 
He argues against the view that man is a creature of reason and that society can be organized in a way that guarantees the happiness of humans. Hmm. Interesting. He insists that humans desire freedom more than happiness. But this can be a destructive force. Since there is no guarantee that humans will use freedom in a constructive way, I think all of those things are uh, pretty obvious. I mean, not obvious. Obvious in a way that if you're sitting around and thinking about it, they're going to be obvious. But it's not like a, you have that cogent and really well-constructed idea like running through your brain unblemished as you move through your day. I mean, but now that, now that I look at it, you know, freedom can be destructive, but it's also necessary, you know. I mean, what, what's the alternative? Siberia? All right. So, you know, he's having an affair, but then it's... So, I, I can't give him props for that, because that's kind of that's kind of uncool, but... Um, I mean, I'm. it's not cool. But, okay, so his first wife died. Uh, the unhappy marriage wife died in 64. She was sick all the time, I guess. And then he got married to Anna... Grigorievna, uh, he got married to Anna. Okay, she, so she was awesome. And uh, she was largely, there's uh, a lot of people that say she was, had a lot to do with um, making him the man that he would be, you know, he was, she was a stabilizing influence. And you know what? Probably this guy needed somebody to be stabilizing. He had a freaking, it looks like a, a bad marriage, and then he had some affair that wasn't was frustrating. And young student, I don't know how young, but eh, it doesn't sound good. Okay, so in '66, so I'm glad he married Anna. So let's give it up for Anna. She was, by all accounts, a good woman, even tempered. Probably the very opposite of this dude. Because, I mean, besides his ability to write awesomely and grow a beard and piss off the government, which are all pretty cool things, uh, <laughs> he's a little nutty, all right? So in 66, old Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky published Crime and Punishment. I'm, I apologize. Uh, I guess that's his most popular novel, according to this thing. I thought Brothers Karamazov was, but whatever. I love Crime and Punishment. It is messed up. It is a messed up deal. And, you know, it's a, it's about a murder. And I think maybe he... Uh, both of his two big works, you know, uh, The Brothers Karamazov and Crime and Punishment are about murder. Probably because of the fact that his father was murdered. It might have, you know, had something to do with it. And, you know, it's basically... It's not really like a murder mystery because... Um, in the way that the Brothers Karamazov is, it's just it's just high, high-level murder mystery. You know, I've read it a couple times, but I've read Crime and Punishment just, I don't know, once or twice. It's about Raskolnikov, this messed-up dude who's kind of nihilistic, and he doesn't, he just, he just, I don't, spoilers? Okay, spoilers. Turn this off if you if you never read Crime and Punishment. Uh, freaking dude, just he's so you know he's so bitter and and has no sense of right and wrong. Yet he does, and he decides he's just gonna kill some you know woman just to do it. And you know. He basically the rest of the the novel is him just dealing with the consequences of his actions. He's like gonna get away with it. He's not gonna get away with it. He wants to turn himself in. He doesn't want to turn himself in. It's a really mess. It's like a, a psychological mind job, and it really pours into this guy's brain. I mean, every nook and cranny. Pretty sweet. I mean, it's not like, it's not like an action thriller this isn't tom clancy you know plot point plot point plot point it's a lot of this dude is just walking around freezing his nuts off in freaking russia thinking about how, what a piece of junk he is all right so <laughs> all right here we get to anyway obviously that was a huge success and uh, he wrote the idiot after that which is 
this says here, the hero of the novel is a good man who attempts to live in a society gone wrong. It's a really, really, really insightful book. Um, so I'm going to skip this one part and get down to the bottom and say get to the Brothers Karamazov. Okay. It's uh, the greatest of Dostoevsky's novels. Okay, I can agree with that. It's, uh, apparently Freud here has old, old Sigmund Freud, the great father of psychotherapy. Uh, I guess that's what they called it. I think that's what they called it back then. Or psychoanalysis. Maybe that's more apt. Uh, so old Freud said it was one of the greatest artists artistic achievements of all time Whew, that's pretty high praise and i like freud as a writer uh, i don't agree with a ton of what he says but for the time the guy was you know pushing the boundaries uh the no novel is about four sons and the guilt of the murder of the father so yeah it's a murder mystery it's like who killed this dude you know and uh fyodor fyodor he's the guy that f sired all these these sons and basically, each son is, uh, you know, it's easy to say caricature, but they're basically a, t a, a type, you know. There's a, Alyosha is the, I would say, kind of the main character. He's the youngest. He's got, like, this really good heart, and he wants to serve God, and he wants to be in this monastery. And then Ivan is this really reasoned dude, and Dimitri wants some cash because mom died. And uh, two of them are Alyosha, and I believe Ivan are, are actual brothers, and Dimitri was, um, the, is their half-brother. And then there's, well, I don't want to get into Smerdyakov um, because he's a... You don't. I don't really know how quick, quickly you know who he is, identity-wise, in the book. Anyway, the book basically, have, if if you have any type of um, idea, the way you look at the world, it basically the brothers all represent worldviews, and I mean they are fleshed out hardcore. It's a long book, but it's worth the trouble, and and it's not just this excuse to you know sometimes i feel like when i'm reading like iron rand or something like that i'm not on a i don't uh, subscribe to iron rand's uh, philosophy but you know you can't say that her books aren't popular so i read them you know i've read them and like atlas shrugged it seems more like just a a piece of philosophy with a couched in a story and I'll admit the story is kind of fascinating, but sometimes it just seems like the story is an excuse to espouse, to propound her ideology. Well, Dostoevsky, he, maybe he had he he's a comes from a he was a Christian, but he writes the atheist with like intensity, and he doesn't. It's not pandering. He like he somehow manages to build, render three hundred and sixty degree characters. You know, uh, people that are you know, it, like the intellectual, the atheist, the religious. You know, the unflagging religious spirit. And anyways, uh, I'll read this last part. Dostoevsky said the last part. Sent the last part of uh, Karamazov to publisher in 80, in November, and then died soon afterward. Okay, that blows. So at the time of his death, he was at the height of his career. So, uh, and many much Russians mourned his death, meaning he was probably really popular, but he was going to be on the level of, like, Tolstoy and get to live in some weird kind of place out in the middle of nowhere and have a bunch of people like bow at his feet or whatever although i don't think dostoevsky would have wanted that and i i think i'll do a video on dostoevsky versus tolstoy and why i think um our buddy fyodor here is uh the cooler of the two dudes although who the better writer is is of course a subjective thing that will probably be argued about and i think most people would probably land on the Tolstoy side, but 
doesn't matter. They're both really brilliant dudes, and I have a, I have a real lack, uh, love for these, um, these Russian dudes. There's a lot of pain, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. But first, let's read a little bit, just the intro. I'm just gonna kind of go through the intro. So it's a really short little intro to the brothers cameras off, um, and it basically breaks down the the father. Okay. So, part one here, history of the family. So, Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov, that's the father. Uh, uh, that's the third son. That's the spiritual son. Okay. It was the third son of Fyodor. So, Fyodor is the dad who gets murdered. Sorry, spoilers. I already said that. Landowner well-known in our own district in his own day. Still remembered among... Us owing to his gloomy and tragic death, which happened 13 years ago. So he's writing this as um, kind of a memoir of this tragic tale of woe. Okay. And which I shall describe in its proper place. I would say quote and unquote, but I'm just going to insert myself into it. Now, since you have the thing in front of your face, hopefully you can follow my crazy uh, mind and the tangential nuttery that I do <laughs> I insert into it okay so for the present I will only say that this quote landowner <laughs> for so we used to call him although he hardly spent a day of his life on his own estate was a strange type yet one pretty frequently to be met with a type abject and v groveling and vicious and at the same time senseless <laughs> but he was one of those senseless persons who are very well capable of looking after their worldly affairs and apparently, after nothing else. Fyodor Pavlovich, for instance, began with next to nothing. Okay, so he's, he's, uh, his estate was of the smallest. He ran to dine at other men's tables. Okay, so basically he describes uh, Fyodor, the guy who gets murdered, as a, kind of a, one of those like hang-around dudes that kind of grubs off other people. You know, but somehow he manages to like make it. Like So he probably sh shakes the right hands or whatever. And... Um, I'll skip ahead to at the same time he was all his life one of the most senseless fantastical fellows in the whole district so he's getting rich but he's senseless and fantastical I repeat it was not stupidity so he's not stupid the majority of these fantastical fellows are shrewd and intelligent enough but just senselessness in a particular national form of it I have another translation that he calls it muddle head muddle headedness and I love that I love the description of this because I think we all know people that are like that are, are successful in like business, but they're they cannot they're just they just they have like their head down and they just they can just shut out the whole world and consequence and anything else and self doubt you know remorse any kind of looking out for the other guy and just but yet they manage to kind of land on top and it seems like the world's kind of weird when you meet these kind of people but they're all over the place i know i know a few all right so old fyodor here's old mr senseless was married twice and he's talking about his sons three sons dimitri by his first wife and ivan and alexi and who is also called alyosha uh, by a second so he talks about his wife and how he married for money, basically. How it came to pass that an heiress... Okay, this is... I'll read straight. How it came to pass that an heiress, who is also a beauty, and moreover, one of those vigorous, intelligent girls, so common in this generation, but sometimes also to be found in the last, could have married such a worthless, puny weakling, as we called him, I won't attempt to explain. I know a young lady of the last, quote, romantic generation, who... After some years of an enigmatic passion for a gentleman, whom she might quite easily have married at any moment, invented insuperable objects to their union, and ended by throwing herself one stormy night into a rather deep and rapid river from a high bank, almost a precipice, and so perished entirely to satisfy her own caprice, and to be like Shakespeare's Ophelia. Okay, I'm going to stop there. The dude, he's got like the snark. He's make. I know this is a sad thing, but this is fiction. This didn't really happen. Uh, he's making fun of this romant, this romantic generation, and how you know this woman threw herself off, basically committed suicide to, in a fashion, 
to be romantic and to, you know, <laughs> and to try to emulate uh, Shakespeare's Ophelia. I love this next part. Indeed, if this precipice, the one she threw herself off of, a chosen and favorite spot of hers had been less picturesque if there had been a prosaic flat bank in his place, most likely the suicide would have not, <laughs> never would have taken place. This is a fact, and probably there have not been a few similar instances in the last two or three generations. So basically, if it hadn't, he, it's, he's making a joke here. Um, and there's a lot of jokes like this throughout this kind of messed up introduction into this family who you're going to be introduced to hardcore. When his second wife died um, in a garret, according to one story of Typhus, or as another version had it, of starvation. Fyodor Pavlovich was drunk when he heard of his wife's, of course, because Fyodor's a freaking complete wreck and mess and doesn't give a crap about anybody but himself. And the story is that he ran out in the street and began shouting with joy, raising his hands to heaven. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. But others say he wept without restraint like a little child, so much that people were sorry for him, in spite of the repulsion he inspired. God, it is quite possible that both versions were true. That he rejoiced at his release, his release being the fact that he didn't have to be married anymore, and at the same time wept for her who released him. As a general rule, people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose. And we ourselves are too. Okay, so he's talking about basically Fyodor, scumbag, uh, Pavlovich over here and he's saying that there's you know there's conflicting reports S that he was happy even though he made all these uh, both of his wives pretty much miserable and 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 he used them and he, he was basically a, just a he was a deadbeat dad completely bereft of any kind of a soul I mean to be honest with you and yet here he is being seen, you know, uh, with real with a real repentant spirit, and also uh, shouting with joy, raising his hands to heaven. And I love how he ends this. As a general rule, people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose, and we ourselves are too. And I think that last phrase there, and we ourselves are too is why I really like Dostoevsky and a really and it's a microcosm of why I like him. He's I think self-aware. He's screw, he had a lot of screw-ups in his life and he had a lot of pain and tragedy as we all do, but I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say I've had some rough times, you know. I've lost people and I've uh, inflicted a lot of uh, self-induced pain in my life I know this is really uplifting <laughs> but dude I'm just trying to be real y'all so for real the dude the dude is like as a writer I think that pain is is what made him great and then the ability to kind of come through and I think that Okay, here's two reasons. I have two theories on why Dostoevsky is such a great writer. A, because he can still kind of be funny even though, even through all this tragedy. And it gives it a more rounded version. I mean, he could have wrote this uh, these, this intro and it could have been the most dour thing ever. I mean, he just talks about nothing but, you know, a bunch of crap. I mean, freaking Fyodor... Uh, is having orgies and doing a bunch of crazy stuff while his friggin' wife is just, you know, left in the, you know, she's left wandering about in the weeds. And he's, he, we've got people killing themselves, we've got people dying of sickness, and basically this loser. And he's talking about it in a... I can't help but laugh at some of it. And I know maybe that's because I'm kind of, uh, you know, kind of a little bit weird. And I have a dark turn of mind some of my, sometimes. But I 
feel for Fyodor Pavlovich, even though he's been described as nothing as a piece of garbage. And uh, in, I think it's that, that last part that we ourselves too, it's basically, you know, glass houses and stones. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you know, take the, take the plank out of your own eye kind of deal and have some uh, regard for your own failings and, and, the person you are but I think the reason I come back to why he's such a good writer so he he can do that I probably think he derived uh, derives a lot of his gallows it's almost gallows humor from actually being on you know on or near the gallows at one point and I mean how the heck and surviving Siberia and being probably falsely imprisoned by some Political apparatchiks are apparatchik. Is that a thing? Do apparatchiks have apparatchiks? I bet they did back then in Russia. Anyways, so he's got that, but he seems like he leveled out, you know, around 40, for, in, you know, in his middle age. Found a decent woman, got his crap together, started pumping out some really good stuff consistently. I mean, these are huge works. And I think that once you've been in hard times, uh, another thing, this is essential, uh, although not completely, it's not essential, but it, it does help. Let me backtrack. I'm not going to say essential for writers, is that it's good to have had good times and bad times and good times and really bad times and really good times and really bad times. And then, I mean, if you're sitting in Siberia for eight years or wherever the heck long he was over there, I mean, sitting down and writing a book, which can be tedious and mind-numbing, and it can steal a tiny bit of your soul one little piece at a time. Um, well, you know what? That doesn't seem so bad, making up a little ma a, a little fiction, a little creating a little story. Uh, not when you got uh, Siberia in your rear view. I'm just saying. It's cold out there, folks. So that's a little breakdown of Dostoevsky. Probably uh, the most definitive breakdown of Dostoevsky and Brothers Karamazov uh, on the internet. I'm just going to go ahead and make that claim. I know I'm a real expert. Hey, I didn't claim to be an expert, but I will say that it is an interesting um, little character study. The guy had a, a rough life. He didn't go to journalism school and, uh, you know, get a job writing on Nash Bridges and then, you know, moved over into whatever. He had an agent with, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this dude, this dude went through the wars, bro. I mean, he actually probably did have to shoot some guns at some people. That sucks. Um, and, you know, Russia's cold and it's messed up and... You know, he died in 1880 before it really got crazy in Russia. I talk about, you know, the killing of the royal family and the revolution of 1917. I think there were two, right? There was Red October, but I think there was one in February or March of 1917. So this country was on the verge of collapse, and I think the, the brothers Karamazov has uh, documents that very well and it also documents how many uh, opposing viewpoints were uh, being bandied about often in the same village or even in the same pub at the same time I don't know what they called pubs back then uh, in Russia but anyway I think it's cool to look at some of these really smart dudes and see where they're coming from once in a while I don't want to break down you know every little thing about his life and all that stuff because I think it. I like to divorce the writer from the work most of the time. I like. I don't want to know. You know. I don't know what what's a great movie. I don't know what. I don't want to know everything about. You know. What my favorite movie is Hell or High Water. The, I put in a video the last ten years. I don't want to know about the friggin' screenwriters. You know what he has for breakfast. But uh, in this case, I think it's pretty instructive. So that is my video on. Homeboy Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky of Russia, uh, at a pretty, I mean, what did he live to, 60, about, about 60? 
He packed a lot in there, folks. So all the writers out there and all the people that are just going through hard times, you know what? You may meet your Anna. You may get your, you may see your brass ring. You may get your thing. And fortunately for Dostoevsky, the second he starts pumping out his good stuff, you know, as soon as he publishes this bad boy, you know, he dies, doesn't get to enjoy it. That sucked. But that's not going to happen. This is, a, I, I'm ending this thing with a sunny message of encouragement. Life's all good. Do some good work. Level out. Or at least try. And if you're, you know, going through Siberia to <laughs> butcher Winston Churchill's phrase, <laughs> if you're going through Siberia, keep going. All right, this teller has words. Peace out.